We are in part two of a series called Rebuilding Your Faith. And this series is for anybody who feels like they need their faith to be refreshed or rebuilt. Maybe you haven't been to church in a long time. Maybe last week was your first week at church in a long time. Maybe you've been, um, you know, trying to wrestle with, do you really believe in Jesus or not? If that's you, this series is for you. This series is also for somebody who comes to church regularly but feels like you're in a season of dryness and disconnection and you feel like you need to reconnect and rebuild your faith after just feeling distant for a while. Now, in this series, we're not going to talk about some of the intellectual barriers to building faith. Questions like, did Jesus really rise from the dead? How can we trust the Bible? That belongs in a category called apologetics. And this series is actually not that kind of series. But if you are wrestling with those intellectual questions, you can scan this QR code. If you um, don't know how to do a QR code, follow, find it after the service uh, on our YouTube channel. You can scan it, and it'll take you to a list of sermons we've already done addressing those big intellectual questions. But this series, Rebuilding Your Faith, is actually actually more about the emotional challenges to rebuilding our faith, the emotional barriers to finding faith in Jesus, which by the way, I believe for most people, the emotional barriers are far bigger than the intellectual barriers, even if we think the intellectual barriers are bigger. So today we're going to talk specifically about dealing with, say it one more time, dealing with Disappointment, specifically disappointment in God. Every Christian at one point or another gets to a place where they feel disappointed with God. And every single one of you here in this room today, if you're not feeling that in some area of your life, I promise you there will come a day where you feel disappointed with God. You feel disappointed that you're still single or disappointed that you're single again, or disappointed just with the state of your marriage. You had hopes and dreams for what you wanted your relationship with your husband or your wife to look like, and it is very far from that reality today. Maybe you're disappointed with a diagnosis you got from the doctor who said, man, you don't have as much time as we thought that you did. Or maybe you've already lost a loved one far too early, and you're feeling very disappointed and missing that person and grieving that person. Maybe you feel disappointed with the sin you're still wrestling with, and you know, obviously, a lot of that feels like your own fault, but you've like prayed to God so many times that you could overcome that sin, and you are still struggling with it, and you feel disappointed. Deep down, if you don't want to admit it, you feel disappointed with God. You feel disappointed that you haven't had certain maybe supernatural experiences that you've been wanting. You feel disappointed with your job situation or your lack of job situation. We all come to a place in life where we feel disappointed with God. And that's hard enough as it is. But especially inside the church world, so often as Christians, when our friends or our family members are dealing with disappointment, we say this to them. We say, listen, if you feel let down, you should really cheer up. Haven't we all said that before? You got to trust that God is going to bring good out of a bad situation. And you're like, that's true, but that does not feel very helpful right now. You should just trust that God's going to make a way, that he's going to do a miracle. We worship a risen Savior, and so you should look up and cheer up and, and, and don't bring that disappointment stuff around here. Maybe nobody says it quite like that, but that's what we feel so often that there's something wrong with being disappointed with God. Then you might have even wondered, like, why do Christians respond that way? Or why do you feel that way? What's the, what's the sort of pressure against admitting that we feel disappointed instead of just stuffing that down? And I think the reality is you maybe have never put the pieces together. But I think for a lot of us, disappointment with God, we fear, leads to disapproval and distance from God. I'm not saying this is true, but this is what we feel, that disappointment with God leads to disapproval and distance from God. We feel like God is so high above us. And if I tell him I'm disappointed with him, who am I to say that to him? Back in the day, uh, me and some of my friends went to see uh, what at the time was one of our favorite bands, a band called Say Anything. Yes, named after the 80s movie. If you are looking for a great, amazing, Jesus-loving band to show your high school or middle school student, Say Anything is not the band, okay? I'm not recommending them. Uh, this is not your pastor recommending that you listen to this band, but this is one of my favorite bands at the time. And we went to see them, and it was uh, all of us who were there were so excited. And then they played 
pretty horribly on stage. I have a suspicion there might have been some substance abuse involved, right, in why they played so bad, but they played so horribly. One of our buddies was actually their sound guy on tour with them, so we got to meet the band afterwards off stage. And it was so awkward because we're like meeting our favorite band after they just completely let us down. And then you better believe when we went and met them, we were like, amazing show, right? Thank you so much. That was so good. We weren't going to be like, hey, you guys were horrible. Because why? Because they feel above us and we don't want them. We don't want to risk their disapproval or their distance, right? If we tell them we're disappointed in them, they're not going to like that very much. We're like, if that's how a band feels, that's only like societally, like just a little bit above us, can you imagine how much God is going to be offended or mad or, or smite you dead? If you tell him that you're disappointed with him, that's how so many of us feel. And so we stuff that disappointment down. Sometimes it stays buried for months or years or decades. We've got this frustration, this angst, this disappointment with God. And it is an emotional barrier with God. It's an emotional barrier to rebuilding your faith. So today I want to show you how God feels about you when you're disappointed with him. How God responds to you when you're disappointed with him. Because I believe it is far different than so many of us assume God would respond. I want to show you the story of Mary Magdalene in John. Look at that. There we go. Beautiful. Just was a demon snuck in there somehow, but I cast it out under my breath. I want to share the story of Mary Magdalene from John 20, verse 1. If you're not familiar with her, this is not Mary, the mother of Jesus. This is a different Mary. And Mary struggled with feeling disappointed with God, and we get to see Jesus respond to her disappointment. Mary is somebody who, on one level, you would think Mary Magdalene should have expected God to bring good out of a bad situation. If anybody should have been able to look on the bright side and cheer up, it would have been Mary Magdalene because Mary Magdalene, the only thing we know about her before she knew Jesus is that she was possessed by seven demons. Then Jesus drove all seven demons out of her. So she's first seen firsthand the power of God and the power of Jesus. Uh, there's sort of like a legend that she was a prostitute as well. We don't know that from scripture. It's possible she was, it's possible that she wasn't, but we do know she had those seven demons in her and Jesus drove them out. Then she went on traveling with him through his public ministry. She pops up here and there throughout the story. And so we can also safely assume that Mary Magdalene had heard from Jesus that he was going to die and that he was going to rise. And again, she's already seen his power at work on display in her life. So she, she, if anybody should have believed that Jesus was going to be able to pull off this resurrection thing, I think it would have been Mary Magdalene. But watch what happens when Mary Magdalene shows up the morning of Easter. Easter morning, here's what happens. Camera folks, can we get on those words? Get me on the words. Whoever's back there on the switcher, thank you so much. Everyone's got to follow along. Here we go. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. And again, this is that moment where she had heard from Jesus that he was going to rise again, and now she's there, and the stone is rolled away. It is possible she could have seen good coming out of this bad situation. Maybe Jesus really rose from the dead, but watch how she responds. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, and we're gonna see what she said in a minute, but first, just a little bit of background. Peter and the one Jesus loved is a guy named John. He's actually the same John that wrote this whole book of John. These were two people in Jesus' inner circle. John refers to himself in third person here as the other disciple. He also loves to throw in that he's the one Jesus loved, right? He's like, Peter, and then this other guy, the one Jesus loved, that's himself. So she goes to Peter and John, the one Jesus loved, and said, and she could have said, hey, the tomb is empty, the stone is rolled away, and maybe he rose, but here's what she says. She said and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. There was no part of herself that was filled with faith in this moment, only disappointment, only unbelief, only disbelief, only lack of faith in Jesus being who he said He was. She is disappointed with God, and nothing is going to change her mind, not even an empty tomb. Now, how do Peter and John respond? Well, here's what happened. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple, that's again John talking about himself in third person, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He's like, I'm the one Jesus loved, and I'm the fastest runner. In case any of you are wondering, right? 
throw that little detail in there. He, that's John, bent over and looked at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. What are these strips of linen? These are the linen uh, materials that were wrapped around the body of Jesus. So the linen is there, but the body's gone. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He, that's Peter, saw the strips of linen, same ones lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, that's John again, talking about himself in third person, who had reached the tomb first also went inside. This is the main part I want you to see. We're going to come back to it in a minute. He saw, and what's that word? So Mary sees the empty tomb and says, somebody took the body. John saw the empty tomb and says, Jesus rose. Who had more faith? And this is not a trick question. John. John had way more faith. Now, how does... What happens in the rest of Mary's story? Now, Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And I can only imagine, we don't know this for sure, but I can only imagine John was like, Mary, you're feeling let down. You should cheer up. You should believe that God is going to bring something good out of this bad situation. I see an empty tomb, and I see a risen Savior. Mary, what's wrong with you? I don't know if John said that for sure, but I can only imagine he said something like that because he saw and believed, and she was unwilling. Talk about little faith. Talk about being disappointed in God when she shouldn't be disappointed in God, which, by the way, is how we feel. I'm disappointed in God, and I know I shouldn't be disappointed in God. I have more faith. I should have more faith. All my friends think I should have more faith. What's wrong with me? Here she is weeping over being let down by Jesus. Anybody ever feel that way? Crying. Why did things go the way they did? Unconsolable. Filled with dis- disappointment over the diagnosis, over the loss over the secret miscarriage, over the breakup, over the addiction, over the job loss, filled with tears going, God, let me down, and nobody can convince me that anything good is going to come out of this. Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And then it looks even worse for a minute. As she wept, she bent over to look to the, into the tomb and saw, what did she see? Two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. Maybe seeing an angel face to face can get her to change her tune. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? And she, she's still unconvinced. They have taken my Lord away, she said. And I don't know where they have put him. Not even an angel could convince her to look on the bright side, to expect good to come out of the situation. Not even an angel could get her to change from disappointment to faith. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not realize that it was Jesus. We didn't know exactly why. Maybe his resurrected body looked a little different. Maybe he had a different facial hair look with his resurrected body. Who knows? But she doesn't recognize it as Jesus. And he asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? This is so funny. Thinking he was the gardener, she said, if you have carried him away, like if you got bored while you were gardening, and thought, I'm gonna go take this body and hide it, right? Why does she think that? Who knows? Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. How does Jesus respond to this woman who now has seen an empty tomb, who's got a best friend of hers telling her, what if he rose? How does Jesus respond to this woman who's unconvinced, even by two angels, who's so filled with unbelief and disappointment in God that even staring face to face with Jesus, she's like, God has let me down. How does he respond? Jesus said to her the most important word for every single human being to hear in their native language, her own name. Jesus said to her, say it with me, Mary. She turned toward him. And cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And her faith is restored. Now, what is the point of this for us? I'm going to put a phrase on the screen. And it's going to sound a little weird at first. But I I want you to stay with me and, and see the significance of this. Jesus has just risen from the dead. Nobody's expecting him anywhere. His calendar, if you ever pray, like wished your calendar was not so full, right? His calendar was completely empty. No demands on his time. Nobody expecting him to heal anybody, to preach anywhere, to go anywhere. Obviously, he only did what he saw the father doing. He didn't let other people run his calendar, 
but still there was all sorts of demands and expectations on his life. There are currently no demands, no expectations on Jesus' life. And what does he do? First thing, when he rises from the dead, Jesus made his first appointment with the one with the most, what's that last word? Disappointment. Do you all see the significance of that? As Jesus has risen, apparently he's hiding in the bushes, watching all this go down. And who shows up that he sees? Peter and John. And John is the one that he loved. And John is the one, don't miss this, John is the one with all the faith. John is the one who sees the grave clothes and the linen and says, oh, that's enough for me to believe. God is working. Jesus is who he said he was. I can't wait to see him. And, and I am all about him. And Jesus hides there in some way until John leaves. And then rather than going first to the one with all the faith, first to the one with all the confidence, first to the one that has got it all together, Jesus says, no, 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 no. I'm going to let him pass by. And I'm going to go first to the woman who will not stop crying. I'm going to go first to the person who has seen all the same evidence and won't believe. I'm going to go first to the woman who looks at me and looks at life and looks at the empty tomb and says, God has blown it. Jesus has blown it. Everyone has let me down and I'm going to stand there weeping and nothing's going to change my mind that God is good. I will never believe. Even though my friend tries to convince me, John, and even though these angels are right here, I will not believe that God is good. I can't believe he's good because I am so broken hearted. That is who Jesus goes to first. Amen? What does that mean? It means, like obviously today, now that the Holy Spirit is here on the earth, Jesus doesn't have to pick and choose who he goes to first, obviously, right? We can all come to the throne of grace with freedom and confidence. But in this moment where his resurrected body, as far as we can tell, can only be in one place at one time, we have a window into the heart of God, that Jesus makes his first priority, not the one with the big faith, but with the little faith. Not the one that's got it all together, not the one who believes God is gonna bring good out of bad situations, but the one weeping, going, God has let me down. That's who Jesus goes to first. So if you've got disappointment about your job, about your relationships, about your health, about the loss, about the situation, and you've been feeling bad, like, I can't bring all this disappointment to God. Yes, you can. And he will not respond to you like that stupid band that I saw, all offended, and like, who are you to criticize me? No, 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 no. He responds in grace and mercy and love. He can handle it. He's not so insecure. His self-esteem is not so low. No, he prioritizes. He moves toward, first, the person who believes in him the least. Can we give God some praise for that in the house, people? Come on! You can bring him your disappointment. And I, I don't know this for sure, but I think Jesus went to her first because he believed, maybe, we don't know, but it might have been such a bigger reward for him than just going to John. I remember... Um, this had to be 15 years ago. My first job in ministry, I was uh, working for this youth group in a very wealthy, affluent church. And all these youth group kids are from wealthy, pretty churchy families, solid families, really put together. They were the easiest kids to lead, the easiest kids to get along with. I'd get up there and lead worship. I'd sound horrible. They'd be like, that was amazing, right? They were just the sweetest kids. And I look back on them fondly. At the same time that I was working part-time for this youth group, I was also working part-time for a boys and girls club in a very rough area. I'm talking at this elementary school, I remember one day like two parents took off their coats and got in a fist fight waiting to pick up their kids. They had to call the police. And the school was not run very well as often is in areas like that. And the kids, um, the kids were kids from difficult, painful, broken, rough families. Then I was in charge of a classroom of 20 or 30 second and third graders. And I got to tell you, if you've seen a second and third grader, they are literally the cutest kids. It's like the cutest age, right? These kids were the cutest kids I have ever seen. And they hated me. (laughs) I like started, um, you know, I had me and this assistant who honestly was pretty 
useless, trying to help me lead this classroom. And I was like, I think it's been since I was in high school that I've had people like uh, swear at me this often. You know what I mean? It's been a long time and it's coming out of the mouths of these little second and third graders. And I'm like, I don't know where you heard that word, but, but now it's being used against me. And they, they literally ran over me. And it was very crazy and very difficult. But at the same time, they're so sweet. They're so cute. And I love them. And so I was like, I'm gonna figure out how to get them on my team how to win them over, right? So we started trying all these different things. Me and my assistant, we built this star chart thing and we tried all these different things. And, and after sitting through a whole day of school in a rough school, none of them were naturally excited to then go to an after school program where we still were making them do like various homework things. But after months of working on it, eventually it started working. They started to enjoy it. We had some different prizes for them. We tried all these different things and eventually they started to enjoy it. And I worked with them for one year and I remember at the end of the year, I had to tell them that I wasn't coming back the next year because I was starting seminary. And some days I wonder, I'm like, should I just have stayed in the, in the boys and girls? I'm just kidding. But I was like, oh, never mind. Anyway, stupid joke, stupid joke. Stay with me. So I remember that last day with the uh, boys and girls club, just saying bye to all of them. And they all were like, bye, Mr. Vince. And some of them started crying. And if I remember, I think I was crying too because there's something so um, beautiful about seeing something that's broken and not working, these little kids, you know, hating me, going to calling me Mr. Vince and loving me and all those sorts of things. When I look back now, 15 years later, and I think about the youth group kids and the after-school program kids, man, I feel so much more warmth in my heart for those kids who hated me at first. I feel, I feel so much more compassion and like I miss them. I can still remember their little faces and some of their names and I feel all this love for them. And I'm not trying to be like paint this picture like, oh, wow, I'm this amazing guy. If you were there in that classroom, you would have felt the exact same thing. You would have felt the same thing for them. That, I believe, is the picture that Jesus and Mary Magdalene paint for us. Mary Magdalene was like the second or third grader crying so mad at God, shaking her fist at him, going, you let me down, and this is horrible, and everything is horrible. And Jesus didn't respond to her like that band I was talking about at the beginning. Jesus responded to her like I responded to those second and third graders. Like I think there was a part of her looking at Mary Magdalene going, you are so cute, right? You, you are so mad at me, and you are so frustrated and so disappointed. But I believe he came to her with the Father's heart with love for her, with compassion for her. God is above us, but he's not above us the way a celebrity is above us that looks down on us. God is so far above us in the way that a parent looks at a second or third grader or an adult looks at the sweetest second or third grader and they can be so mad at you and you still feel all of this love and compassion and care for them. You are the children of God. You are a child of God, and you are a child of God, and you are a child of God, and when you are disappointed with him, he is not disappointed with you. When you are mad at him, he is not mad at you. When you have little faith, he does not have little love for you. You can come to him exactly as you are, and he will receive you. Can I get an amen? Is that not good news? So don't push that disappointment down. You don't have to. If Mary Magdalene could stand there with the empty tomb and the angels and John and be like, he didn't rise and weep and weep and weep, then you can bring your unbelief and disappointment to God and he will take you just as you are. Here's my encouragement to you though to stay in the process and not bail even when you are so frustrated towards God. There's one more piece of this story, and this is really my favorite part. I want to show you how it ends. After Jesus says to Mary, Rabboni, here's what Jesus says to her next. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. So Jesus says to Mary, I want you not John. I want you, Mary, to go and tell the rest of the apostles that I'm alive. And she goes, I'm on it. Here's what happens. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have, what are those three words? 
seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Don't you think, we don't know for sure, but don't you think that the apostles responded differently to Mary Magdalene than they would have if it had been John who burst through the door? If John had burst through the door, the one that Jesus loved, the one who had all the faith, the one who saw the empty grave and said, I believe that he rose. John burst through the door and he's like, he rose. And they're going to be like, did he really though? Right? You're always believing the best. But when Mary goes from this place of brokenness and unbelief, and I'm sure they knew that on some level about her personality, when she walks in the room and says, I've seen the Lord, I believe it had so much greater impact. That is a paradigm we see all throughout Scripture. I love that Randy during communion mentioned the Apostle Paul because the same thing was true with him. When God chose uh, Paul, formerly Saul, to go preach the message of Jesus to the entire world, he chose somebody who did not believe in him. He chose somebody who was anti-God so that when Paul went to go tell people about Jesus, they'd be like, if formerly Saul, Paul believes, then maybe it's true. Here's the point for you. If you are wrestling to find faith, here's the, what can be the purpose behind it. The harder the faith is to find, the easier it is to give away. The harder that faith is for you to find, when you find it, the more powerful it is going to be with the people in your life. When you are in that place of weeping, 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 God, let me down. When you get to the place where you can say, I've seen the Lord, just like Mary did, that is going to be so much more powerful than the person who had faith all along. I experienced this in a big way. Man, this was like less than a year ago. I've shared this in church before, but um, not January, but the January before. January 2023, uh, Joanna and I went through a miscarriage. And before we had gone through that miscarriage, we um, knew other people had gone through miscarriages. And I was always kind of like, I'm sorry, that's so tough. Um, But I didn't really get it. I was like, you didn't even see the baby. Like, how hard is it? I felt that until we had our own miscarriage. And I was broken. So, so incredibly sad. And it was very hard to find faith in God during that time. I was disappointed in God. I was shaking my fist at God. And all these people tried to give me faith, right? They were like, Look on the bright side. God will bring good out of it. I'm sure he's got another child for you, blah, 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 blah. And when people would tell me that that hadn't been through it, it didn't do much in me. It didn't do much for me. It was hard for them to give me faith, and I couldn't receive it because they hadn't been through it. Then I remember um, one day going out to a Mexican restaurant with um, a guy from our church. I believe he's in his 50s, 60s, something like that. And I shared um, about the miscarriage, and he... um, shared with me that him and his wife, I think it was 20 or 30 years before, had had a stillbirth. And we're sitting in this you know, Mexican restaurant 20 or 30 years later, and he starts weeping over his own loss. But I knew him. I knew him well. And I knew he had not given up his faith in Jesus. I knew he believed in the goodness of God and the, 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 the work of God and the love of God. And he was holding this pain and this faith in God together at the same time, somehow. And that pain, I'm not saying that, you know, an early miscarriage, it was very early for us. I'm not saying an early miscarriage is, you know, so much easier than a stillbirth, but I knew that he had been through more pain than I had been through. And he had fought through the pain, fought through the disappointment, fought through the unbelief, and now he was able to keep faith in God without pushing any of that pain away. And let me tell you, that faith that he had fought for, I was able to receive. He didn't even say, God's gonna bring something good out about from this. He didn't even say, you should trust God, we trusted God and we made it through, you can make it through. He didn't do any of that. He didn't even give me any encouragement or exhortation. He just wept with the, his own pain, but I could see that his own pain was still held in tension with his own faith and I walked out of that restaurant with faith restored in me. Because he had to fight so hard to find it, 
It was that much easier, and he didn't even try, but it was that much easier for him to give it away to me. I received it without him even trying because he, I could tell he had to work so hard and fight so hard to still believe in the goodness of God after going through such a painful loss. So what I'm telling you is if you can stay in it, if you can stay connected to Jesus, even when you're so mad at him, even when you're so frustrated at him, even when you're so disappointed in him, if you can stay connected to him through the divorce, through the cancer, through the death, through the car accident, through the pain, through the suffering, through the depression, through the anxiety, if you can stay with Jesus and fight for faith over the weeks and months and years and decades on the other side of that, when faith is restored, you're going to have something of greater worth than gold. Something that you can give to people who are struggling to find faith. And when you come alongside them and say, yeah, here's what I went through. And yet I still believe in the goodness of God. Here's what I went through. And I can't even explain it, but I still believe that God is loving. Here's what I went through. And I, and I don't know, I don't have any good solutions. But at one point, I heard Jesus say my name just like he said it to Mary. In that place of faith that's been fought for so hard, you will be able to give hope to somebody who feels hopeless. So don't give up. Don't walk away. Stay connected to Jesus. Because after you hear him say your name, and you might not hear it for a long time, but when you hear him say your name, just like Mary heard him say her name. When you go and run to the other disciples and say, I've seen the Lord, they're gonna believe you and they're gonna buy it. And you're gonna be able to give faith to people who are struggling for faith. So here's my simple challenge for you today. About as simple as they come. If you've got disappointment with God because of pain in your life, Talk to God about your disappointment and talk to a person about your disappointment. Just like Mary stood there weeping, saying, I'm all alone and God has let me down. She said that out loud. She said it to the gardener, right? You're like, I don't want to share my feelings with other people. She was apparently fine to share it with the gardener. And that's what God used. Share it with a person, a, a small group leader, a life group leader, a connect group leader, a pastor, a friend, whoever. Somebody who loves Jesus. Talk about your disappointment with a person and talk about it with God. Maybe you write it all down. Maybe you gotta get in the car and drive and just yell at him. He can handle it the same way I could handle that animosity from the second and third graders. He can handle it. He is with you. Talk to him about it. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. I wanna close by giving you a chance to say yes to a relationship with Jesus. No matter what you've done, he still wants that relationship with you. No matter what darkness you've been in, he, he delivered Mary from those seven demons and he can deliver you from whatever darkness you've been in, whatever darkness you're in today. A relationship with Jesus is not about trying to become a better person, a church person, jump through all the right hoops, say all the right things, learn enough about the Bible. All those things are good, but that doesn't get you saved. What gets you saved is when you come to Jesus and just say, I know I've blown it and I need forgiveness and I need grace and I need mercy. And when you come to Jesus and ask for forgiveness, the blood that he shed on the cross means that you always receive a yes. We, you and I deserve to be punished for our sins. The whole point of the cross was Jesus took that punishment. It went on him so it doesn't have to go on you and I as long as you surrender your life to Jesus. When you do that, the cross gets applied to you. You receive forgiveness and grace and mercy. You receive the promise of heaven. You receive deliverance from the possibility of hell. And you receive the Holy Spirit inside you. So if you want that grace, that mercy, that forgiveness, the hope of eternal life, in just a minute, I'm going to ask you to raise a hand. Everyone's head is going to be bowed. Nobody's going to see it. I'm not going to make you walk the aisle. I'm not going to make you fill out a card. I'm not going to make you do any of that. I'm just going to make you raise a hand to say, I need to give my life to Jesus and he will take you as you are. Nothing magical about the hand, just a way with your body to say you're saying yes. After that, I'll lead us through a simple prayer of surrender to Jesus. And if you raise your hand, you could repeat after me either out loud or in your heart, either one. If you already are a Christian, same thing. You can repeat after me to reaffirm your faith if you want or you can just sit quietly. But let's bow our heads and close our eyes. 
just for a minute, if you are ready to surrender your life to Jesus, to receive forgiveness, grace, mercy, and the promise of heaven, on the count of three, would you slip one hand in the air? One, two, three. Raise it up real high. Slip it up slightly. I see the hand in the middle. I see a bunch of hands on the right. All right, I saw several hands throughout there. I see a hand on the left, yes. You put your hands down now, and again, if you raised your hand or if you already are a Christian and you want to reaffirm your faith, either out loud or in your heart, repeat after me. Say, dear Jesus, I come to you with my doubt, my disappointment, my pain, my sin. I thank you for the cross and for the resurrection. I surrender myself to you, both now and for all eternity. I thank you for forgiving accepting and loving me for the rest of my days I will follow you in Jesus name everybody said we have got some praise for the people that just took that step today come on so good praise God if you are new we would love to see you after the service grab your gift stop by the five minute meetup if you need prayer the prayer team would love to pray for you up here. I'm so glad you came today. I love you all so much, and I'll see you next week for Rebuilding Your Faith, part three. God bless. Have a great week.